Hi and welcome to the Open Tech Lab. In today's video I want to share with you a couple of little projects I've been working on on the 3D printer and I've been using it to produce various enclosures for prototype electronics. And the thing about uh, producing enclosures is that it's usually quite a lot of effort to produce things by hand and it's very difficult to produce things to a level of quality uh, that's sufficient when you're only producing short runs. But with a 3D printer there are some opportunities to fabricate things that are really quite high quality with very little effort. So in this video we're going to have a look at a couple of different approaches I've been taking but also I want to demonstrate some of the options for open source 3D modeling tools and we'll have a look at those and do a little tutorial and review uh, of both those options. So let's get started. So anyone who's been following this channel closely will know that I've got an ongoing project involving this little synthesizer board here. And this synthesizer features the ADF4351, uh, which is a little phase lock loop chip which can produce any frequency pretty much all the way up to 4.4 gigahertz. And uh, this thing's pretty cheap and so it's quite a low cost uh, solution for generating various RF tones. Now this thing can be controlled over SPI and therefore I've got this little microcontroller, the STM32F1. And uh, in this case, it's being used as a bridge between the PC and uh, the synthesizer. So can, commands can be sent in over USB and then they're received by the microcontroller and in turn, a microcontroller uses those commands to control the, the synthesizer chip. So it's worked out very nicely. But up until this point, uh, it's all been a bit of an unstable prototype. I've just been carrying these two boards around loose, uh, just attaching them together with jumper wires. Uh, but I'd like to take this thing to the next level. I'd like to make it into a more robust type of object. And for that purpose, I want to get it mounted up inside a metal box. And that metal box will shield it from uh, spurious radiations. And it will also protect the synthesizer from uh, various radiations that it might pick up itself. And uh, on the whole, I also want to just make the thing a whole lot more robust. So let's have a look at how the 3D printer can help make that happen. So for an enclosure, I chose this item on AliExpress. This is pretty much the smallest, cheapest metal box that's large enough to contain uh, the boards that I need to put inside of it. And it's on sale for $5.88 when you include shipping. Now this uh, box, if you look at it, is a metal extrusion. Uh, so it consists of a body that uh, is extruded out of aluminium, and then it has two aluminium end plates that screw onto the end. Now, typically with these extruded aluminium uh, enclosures, you have a pair of runners which are uh, present so that you can insert a PCB between the two, which is all well and good if you plan to design a custom PCB for this box. Uh, you can just design it to have the correct dimensions to fit within it. But unfortunately, if you're not planning to design a custom PCB, if you just want to install a standard one, most of the time it becomes a lot harder to fit something inside. And therefore, we need some way of mounting something inside this box. We need some kind of insert. And this is how the 3D printer can help us. So I did the design work for this in FreeCAD. And what I have here is a two-part solution. Uh, so there is a bottom part here that holds the boards and the wiring. And then there's a top part that uh, slots into the bottom to hold the boards in place. And then together, the two parts slide inside the enclosure. Now one of the nice things about doing this is that we don't have to worry very much about the quality of the print because of course none of this will be visible to the outside world. And therefore we can set the print feed rate pretty fast and we can set the layers quite thick and so we can get the printing job done quickly. Uh, which is helpful because actually it took me a couple of attempts to get the uh, dimensions on this thing just right. So here we have the 3D printed parts, top and bottom. Now let's have a look at how the circuit boards fit inside. So to begin with, I've got the synth board here, which has four mounts around the outside. And uh, because of this, it's quite easy to mount. I can just slot it into four little posts, which are uh, laid out correctly, and this holds it nicely in place. 
Now the controller board is a bit more of a challenge because it doesn't have any mounting holes, but we can still encircle it on three sides in a slot, uh, but we need a way to stop it sliding out the end, uh, which is why the top part has this little tongue here. And uh, when I uh, clip the, the top in place, just slide it on, uh, it uh, slots onto this uh, little jumper header here, which stops the thing from falling out. And then there's a couple of, uh, couple of dowel rods here that just keep it in place, a couple of posts that just uh, hold the top on and stop it from sliding off. And then on the end here, there's a little channel under here, and uh, you might be able to see the uh, pins to the debugger way down in there, so I can actually get the debug header down that slot if I really need to, which is useful for reprogramming the board. Then we have a pair of slots here and here, and these are meant to contain a pair of indicator LEDs which are wired back to the controller board. Now if we take a closer look at the LED slot here, you can see that the base of the spot slot is square with a rounded cutout on the end, and then a tongue from the top part comes down to form a clamp. So that on the other side uh, here, I've got the LED slotted in, and you can see that the tongue prevents the LED from sliding back away from the end plate, which will uh, cover, o o cover this over. So the LED is going to be uh, completely trapped in place between uh, the 3D printed part and the end plate, which is gonna fit over the top. Okay, so now all the wiring is in place, and I would say this is probably just about the worst aspect of this design. It is a bit of a rat's nest, and uh, the design doesn't have anything in the way of uh, cable management to keep these wires tidy. But all the same, it won't be too much of a problem when the whole thing's slotted together. So I can just slot the synthesizer board onto the mounting posts here, uh, press that down, and then I can uh, put the uh, top piece on top here, slot it in. Okay, and that's all held together as a nice solid unit and now we can uh, slide this inside inside the box fits in very snugly nice very nice looking good okay and now I can just apply the end plates here uh, one there and one here and here we have the final assembled article. And to me at least, I would say this is a pretty convincing prototype. And I'd be pretty happy to show this to anyone. And I'm hopeful that this will have enough durability to give me quite a few years of good use. So good outcome. So now I want to do a little introduction on how to do solid modeling inside FreeCAD. And FreeCAD is open source 3D modeling software. It's got a bunch of different uh, modes of operation, uh, different workbenches you see here. Uh, but I want to focus on the part design workbench, which for me is the most useful one. Now I'm gonna be doing this uh, demonstration on FreeCAD's version 0 0.16, which was released about a year ago. Hopefully we'll get a new version coming out soon. Uh, there's been a bunch of work going on. I've been uh, experimenting with the FreeCAD nightly builds and there's lots of interesting stuff uh, being uh, produced so hopefully we'll get that released very soon uh, but for this demo I'm going to uh, be demonstrating with uh, FreeCAD 0.16 so let's get started so to begin with I'm on the uh, start page here of FreeCAD and we have a little uh, link here uh, to jump into the part design workbench so if we jump in here, uh, now what we have here is a 3D workspace. And you might be able to see just down here in the corner, uh, there's a 3D axis showing uh, the direction we're pointed. Okay, so to begin with, I'm going to create a sketch. Now a sketch is a 2D geometry that we're going to be drawing inside this 3D space. So for this first sketch, we have to decide which way we want the sketch to be pointing. And I want to draw this sketch on the X, Y plane. Okay, so let's begin by drawing some geometry. And uh, I want to draw a five pointed polygon. So I'm gonna be using this polygon tool and I'll start drawing five points, uh, pretty much at random. Uh, within this 2D space. Okay, so now I have this polygon, I can drag it around and manipulate it. Now on the left here, uh, it says under constrained sketch with 10 degrees of freedom. And that's of course the, uh, the case because I have uh, five different points here and each of these can be moved up, down uh, or left, right. So we've got a total of 10 degrees of freedom. So we need to try and cut those uh, 
uh, degrees of freedom down until uh, we have none left and that, at that point the sketch will be completely defined. So first of all I'm going to select these two bottom points and this uh, construction line running down the centre and uh, I'm going to apply a mirror constraint. Okay, so now these two points are locked together with mirror symmetry about um, this axis. And because uh, uh, these two points are uh, constrained in one direction, we've now lost two degrees of freedom from the sketch. Now, let me just um, drag this toolbar down. There we go. Okay, so let's uh, apply some more constraints to this sketch. So I'm going to do another mirror here. Okay, so now we've got a vertical line and a horizontal line. And then I'm going to select this line here and I'm going to apply a horizontal constraint which keeps this line in the horizontal direction. And similarly, I'm going to apply a vertical constraint to this line here. There we are, okay. So now uh, you can see we've got a rectangle with a chunk cut out the corner. Now I'm going to cons uh, put, take this point here and make it coincident with this construction line running down the middle using this constraint. Here we go. And now uh, we have a mirror, uh, mirror symmetry between the top and the bottom and uh, this point is halfway between the two. Next I'd like to uh, uh, specify the size of this thing. Now uh, with that we do the same thing. We, set the, we select two points and I'm going to select the horizontal dimension tool. Now I want this uh, object to be 120 millimeters wide. Now this dimension here is again a constraint and it locks these two points into position saying that they must always be horizontally 120 millimeters separated. And I can edit this constraint and change the value so I can make them 160 and it goes and recalculates the geometry. So let's uh, change that back. Now if I do the same to set the height of the figure uh, now if I select a vertical constraint and set the length to be 60 millimeters here, now we have uh, a rectangle which is twice as wide as it is high. Now there's one last thing to do to get the, this thing completely constrained. We've got one degree of freedom left and that's to set the angle of this thing and I would like it to be at 45 degrees. So I'm going to select these two lines here and uh, apply an angle constraint. And uh, if I do that, uh, we have an opportunity to type the angle in. So I'm going to put 135 degrees. There we go, and that angle is now locked. And now the sketch has gone green to show that it's completely defined. And of course, we can change the angle. We could check, uh, set it to 170, make it really oblique. Um, but for this demo, I would like 135 degrees. Okay. Now just to add a little bit more to this uh, example, I want to cut a couple of holes in this. So I'll draw a couple of circles uh, on the left and the right. And uh, now we have a few uh, more uh, undefined uh, degrees of freedom to specify. So I'm going to select this circle and this circle and I'm going to apply an equal constraint. And this means that the uh, radius of these two circles is now lock together. So I can now apply a radius constraint uh, to this circle and I think I would like it to be 12 millimeters in diameter. Now I want to take this uh, center point and this center point and this construction line and apply another mirror constraint so that they're symmetrical about the middle. Uh, I'm going to make this point coincident with the horizontal construction line and then I want to uh, uh, specify the horizontal separation between these two and I'm going to set it to 60 millimeters. And now we're back to having a completely constrained sketch. Okay, so let's close out of the sketch now. And you can see that we have this geometry and it's floating in 3D space. So now we can do something with it. Um, now there are a bunch of different things we can do with a sketch, uh, but the simplest thing is just to extrude it out a certain distance uh, or pad it to use the terminology of FreeCAD. Now as you can see it's taken our sketch and turned it into a 3D object and we can specify any width that we want to see here. Uh, this is really cool, so uh, let's set that to be, uh, why, not, why don't we have 40 millimeters width, okay. 
and now we have a solid object in 3D space. Now if we flip over to the model tab we can see a structural diagram of what we've got. We've got a pad object in our unnamed uh, workspace and uh, inside that pad is the sketch which is still there but it's hidden uh, but I can uh, make it visible and uh, now you can see the sketch is visible merged in with the object that derives from it. Now uh, one of the cool things about uh, solid modeling in general is that uh, everything is non-destructive so we can always go back and make changes to uh, our original sketch. So for example I can take this uh, radius here from 12 millimeters and make it I don't know 16 millimeters and uh, then if we close the sketch out uh, everything's updated so we've uh, been able to go back and make changes as we see how the 3D object's working out. So this is really powerful. But so far we've only got a single step, this single extrusion. So let's uh, add another sketch. Now this time I'm going to go a bit fancy and I'm going to draw the sketch on this face. So I'm going to select the face here and uh, click uh, the new sketch button and now we are um, orientated so we're face, uh, face onto that uh, uh, that face on the 3D object that I just selected. Now what I want to do is I want to draw a circle in the middle of this face here. Um, so to do that we need to reference some of the external geometry uh, of the objects that we are uh, basing this off of. And to do that I can click on this tool here and this creates an edge link to external geometry. So that means that I can click on edges that are um, uh, sort of behind the sketch and it will create construction lines from uh, this geometry. And there we are, we now have a couple of construction lines in our sketch. Now I'd like to add a few more construction lines of my own, so I'm going to draw a line. Now at the moment uh, what I'm drawing is just normal geometry. Um, but if I click on the line after I draw it and click on this button here, this toggles this line into being a construction line, which means that it's not geometry that's going to come out of the sketch, it's just purely uh, going to be used for uh, constructing the geometry we want. And uh, I want to set this uh, line to have uh, the vertical constraint and I want to set it so that it's a mirror between these two points. Uh, so rather than mirroring the two points about the line, we're making the line uh, sit halfway between the two points. And now if we uh, do the same, draw a, another line here. Uh, now if you actually draw something that looks horizontal, it will automatically apply a horizontal constraint. But I've just been avoiding doing that up until now to just make it a bit clearer um, by manually adding those constraints. So again, let me put that line halfway between the two points here and here. Oh yes, and I need to make it a construction line, which turns it blue. Now let's draw my circle. Here we go. So now I want to put the center point on the vertical line and I want to put the center point on the horizontal line. And now it's sitting right slap bang in the middle of the face. And now let's put a radius constraint on this thing and let's set it to 15 millimeters uh, like the other holes. There we go. So now let's um, close this sketch out and again we've got that uh, geometry, that 2D geometry sitting in 3D space. So now we can do something with that. So we could uh, do another pad and uh, uh, extrude a little bit of geometry off the side here. Uh, but in this case I want to do a cut so we'll uh, cut down through and burrow a hole through the 3D object. Uh, so to do that I've got my sketch and I will uh, create a pocket which is how you do that cutting. And you can see it started off giving me a pocket five millimeters deep and it's given me this um, uh, this little, uh, little hole in the side here. But uh, for this demonstration I want to go through all so it just goes all the way through through the bottom. Now when I first started using 3D modeling tools this really blew my mind uh, because this 3D shape of this face in here it's a really non-trivial piece of 3D geometry and this solid modeler has just come in and uh, calculated this completely seamlessly and uh, this uh, edge here is a complicated uh, shape and it's just gone in and worked it all out and uh, 
the ideal of this uh, 3D modeler is, as I say, everything is non-destructive. So again, we can go back to the start and we can go back and uh, change the uh, radiuses of these circles and uh, uh, change those to something else, uh, close out of the sketch and the whole thing updates itself and everything is recalculated. And so we can uh, just mess around with this and change dimensions until uh, we've got a 3D object that looks good. And uh, of course, with the 3D modeling, we can just keep adding pockets and pads on the sides and uh, add things on and cut things away until we have an object that exactly meets our specification. So now if we reopen the enclosure in FreeCAD, we can see how the different stages go together to build up the final model. So here I've got the first pad, it's a blank to fit inside the metal box. And then we've got a couple of cutouts for the PCBs, uh, a little bit of uh, space underneath the arm board, uh, got a cutout for the SMA, uh, some mounting posts for the synthesizer board, uh, some standoffs to lift it up a bit, uh, some cutouts uh, for wiring and various things that need a bit of space. Uh, then we've got the channels for the LED wiring. Uh, then we've got one of the um, uh, slots that the LED fits into and then a mirror of that slot. So we've got two, one on both sides. Uh, then I decided to make it a bit easier to fit in the box by adding these uh, little flares at the end that uh, make it a bit easier to slide in. And then uh, a cutaway to uh, make space for the top frame that's gonna slot on top. And then finally, uh, a little locator pin to keep the top part where it should be. So you can see that if we keep adding pads and pockets, we can build up a solid object that has a really complicated structure like this one does. Now, I wouldn't be fair in my review of FreeCAD if I didn't point out that there are quite a few uh, things in the UI that aren't as elegant as they could be and uh, a fair few bugs and glitches and pitfalls that you may well run into if you start doing any serious work with it. And this is unfortunate really. And if you've been spoiled by using any of the proprietary tools like Fusion 360 or SolidWorks, you'll probably find FreeCAD really, really uncomfortable to use by comparison. Now, just to add a bit of nuance to this, I wanna say that the project that FreeCAD team are undertaking is an absolutely enormous undertaking. This is no small thing to make a general purpose 3D CAD modeler like this. And the fact that they've got it as far as they have just shows the dedication that they've put into it. And in many ways, uh, it's easy to poke holes in FreeCAD and just point out what it doesn't have. So for example, it doesn't have any assembly tools uh, for assembling parts together. And as I say, the part design workbench still uh, could do with quite a few improvements. But weighing against that, I want to show you this. So this is the Open Hub uh, run by Black Duck Software. And this allows you to get a little viewpoint into the status of an open source project so you can see how well it's growing and developing. And it's interesting that right on the top line, you can see that this website has automatically figured out that the FreeCAD project has very, very high activity. And uh, as we scroll down, we can get all kinds of interesting metrics about this project. And uh, as we go down to these graphs, we can see some really interesting figures. So they have, uh, uh, you know, over 2.5 million lines of code in this thing. And uh, last month there were 207 kit commits into the source code repository. And those came in from 25 contributors. So this is certainly a very, very healthy project. And in general, this uh, Open Hub website, I use it all the time just to try and figure out whether an open source project is growing and developing, whether it's healthy or whether it's uh, uh, petering out a little bit. But as you can see with this project, it is thriving in terms of the amount of contributions going into it. Now in the world of proprietary software, if a piece of software isn't all there and perfect right at the get-go, uh, usually you could write it off as not being very good quality. Whereas open source software is usually there for the long haul. So open source software will tend to last uh, a decade, two decades or more. And so in this way, even though progress towards this, this goal of making a high quality 3D modeler is slow and it's a complex project, uh, no one should ever count this project out or any other open source project because over time I fully expect that all of the problems that I've run into with FreeCAD will be solved. And certainly as it becomes a more and more usable tool over time, it also snowballs uh, because more and more people see it as something viable that they could add a little bit of code to. 
to. And so I'd say that looking at the FreeCAD project today, they are right on the cusp of having something that is ready for general purpose use every day. And I think there are not that many problems that will need to be solved before that becomes possible. And there's one other thing I'd say about the open source software situation is that if you can get the job done with an open source piece of software rather than a proprietary tool, it's well worth trying to do so. Because uh, even though the proprietary software might be nicer to use in some ways, uh, with the open source software, it's always growing and developing. And if you can get the job done with it, it's something that uh, you can use in your workflow forever and it will never be taken away from you no matter what. Whereas with proprietary tools, you'll need to care about getting licenses and making sure that you have access to it down the years into the future. And so for this reason, I always prioritize free and open source software whenever I can. And indeed, that's what this channel is all about. So that just about wraps things up for my first example, which leads me on to my second example, which is this 3D printed frame you see here. Now, the context of this is that when you're doing some embedded development, typically you'll have a development board of some kind and you might have some peripheral boards and you might have a bit of fragile wiring and you might have some probes and test leads attached to it. And so the whole thing can easily become a really tangled up mess and it's very easy for it to become broken up over time. So it might get knocked or yanked in various ways. And so you're gonna run into problems with the mechanical integrity of your test setup. So to combat this, sometimes I've uh, worked in situations where the um, development board has been taped to a piece of wood or, or, or screwed to a piece of wood or something like that, which is okay, uh, but it is a bit limited in some ways. So one nice thing about this frame is that I've got these four legs here. So with those legs, it means that I can flip it over easily and see the other side. So I can easily access either side really quickly, which is something you never can do with a wooden board. So I really like this and I really like the way it's turned out. Now, if you look at this, what you actually see here is uh, an Intel based single board computer here. And then I've got this USB peripheral board on the side. And also I added um, four mounting holes on top for, for a hard disk so you can put this uh, screw this in place on top so you can have that on there although that means that it doesn't work quite as well when it comes to flipping it over to the other side so typically I've been just having the hard disk uh, loose off to the side of this thing but still the integrity that I've got from this frame has been really really good. Now I designed this thing with OpenSCAD, which is another open source 3D CAD modeling application. But the philosophy behind OpenSCAD is very different from FreeCAD. It's not graphical. In fact, it's a programming language, which is an interesting concept uh, compared to uh, the likes of FreeCAD. So let's have a look at how it works and we'll find out how it is to use. So here I am sitting inside the user interface of OpenSCAD and this is what you'll be presented with when you start it up for the first time. So you have a code editor on the left hand side here, you have a little uh, error and warning console in the bottom and then you have a 3D view that allows you to visualize the parts that you're designing. Now I'm not a huge fan of the text editor that's built into OpenSCAD. I prefer to use Vim. So here on the left, you can see I'm running NeoVim with the OpenSCAD syntax highlighting plugin installed. And then I have OpenSCAD running on the right with just the preview pane up. And uh, the way it works is that if you want to use an external text editor, you open up the file you're editing in OpenSCAD and then open up the same file in your text editor. And then OpenSCAD will watch the file every time it changes. And when it detects a change, it will update the visualization here. And so all you have to do is type code into your text editor. And every time you save the file, uh, the visualization will get updated uh, inside OpenSCAD. So it works out very nicely. Now the language of OpenSCAD is really, really simple to learn. So to begin with, let me just do some quick examples just to show off the syntax of OpenSCAD. So to begin with, I want to put in a, a sphere and uh, I'm gonna set it to have a radius of 75 units. Okay, let's save that. And there you can see a sphere has appeared in the workspace here. There we go. And the way this is working is that these uh, this sort of function, it returns some geometry and all the geometry that goes uh, back to the file level gets collected by OpenSCAD and is what appears in the workspace. 
So we can add a second object, we can add a cube and set its size to 100 here. And that too gets collected in the workspace. Now you can see that the uh, uh, sphere has been centered at its uh, midpoint in the middle and that's been put at the origin, whereas the cube has been put off to the side. And that's just the default behavior of these two different objects. But we can also set center equals true on the cube and then it too will be centered in the middle of the, uh, the origin here. Now to make modifications, we need to wrap these, uh, these things in things that we want to modify it with. So for example, I can put a rotate uh, modifier around this and I can rotate it 45 degrees around the X axis. Now all angles in OpenSCAD are specified in units of a degree, uh, which makes things a bit easier in my opinion. You don't have to worry about messing around calculating radians and dividing everything by 2 pi or anything like that. So it makes it very simple. So here I've wrapped the cube in a rotate. So let's do that. And there you can see it's spun around 45 degrees uh, in the visualization. Now in this case, uh, given that the rotate uh, modifier only has a single child, we can actually forego the curly brackets altogether and just turn this into a one-liner. So we can put it like this if we want to, or break it onto two lines like that, uh, which makes it a bit more concise. Now let's do a more complex modification. So if we take these uh, two objects that we have here, uh, we can put the difference modifier around them and that will take one and calculate the difference between them and we'll do a 3d boolean operation there you go and uh, here we've cut the cube out of the middle of the sphere and of course if we go and change the order uh, we can cut the sphere out of the cube like that so you can see this is a really really simple language to use and uh, there really isn't that much more to it than that. So the programming language is simple enough so that all you really need is this cheat sheet and this just has a couple of dozen things on it and so the language is really simple to pick up and I don't think you'll have too much problem using it. So by way of comparison let's take the widget that we created in FreeCAD earlier and see about recreating it in OpenSCAD and see how difficult that turns out to be. So here I have an empty document. So first of all, let's set up some variables. So I'm going to set up the width, height uh, equals 60 millimeters, thickness equals 40, hole diameter equals 24. Okay, and we'll use those because uh, it's never good to fill your code with magic numbers. So having variables makes it all a lot tidier. So to begin with, we're going to create a two-dimensional polygon object. Uh, the outline of the widget. So I'm going to create a polygon here and now we just have to go and uh, fill in the points. So I'm going to put in width minus half width over 2 minus half height over 2 and we need a few of those like that and let's get the points as we go around the outline of this object like this, width over 2, okay, and then last point, there we go, let's save that. And there we have the outline of our widgets. Now, this is a 2D object, a 2D polygon. And when you have a 2D object in 3D space, OpenSCAD just renders it as an object that has a one, one unit, one millimeter thickness here. So the, that's our 2D object. So of course we need to turn it into a, a 3D object. Oh, actually, first of all, um, I want to uh, s cut the holes inside of it. So let's do that. So we're gonna wrap this in a difference like this and like that and then go in and set our indentation here and let's cut out a circle so we can put in a circle and we can set the diameter to equal the whole diameter here like that and now we have a hole in the middle uh, but we need to modify that circle to 
translate it to the right position. So let's just set that to minus width over four comma zero like that. There we go. And now the hole's uh, in the correct position. Now that's one hole. Of course, we need the other hole so we can repeat this line and uh, re uh, reverse the translation there. So now we've got the two holes. So now we've got that uh, 2D profile. And that, of course, is equivalent to that sketch we did when we started out in FreeCAD. So now let's uh, do an extrusion so we can uh, give this a little bit of thickness. Uh, so let's do linear extrude uh, thickness like that. There we go. And now we have the first step in our 3D object. So already we're halfway there. So that's really, really good. OK, so now uh, the only thing we've got to do is cut out that hole that we have on this face. So what we can do for that is first set up a cylinder, which we'll cut away from the object with. So I want a cylinder. Um, and I want its height to be a really, really large number, effectively infinity. And then I'm going to set diameter equals the whole diameter. There we go. And now we have a really, really big cylinder coming out. And also if I set center equals true on this, that means that it uh, is centered on the axis. So it's not off to one side, it's sticking out both sides. OK, and now if I rotate that, 90 degrees that should uh, get it onto its side there we go and now let's uh, rotate it uh, minus 45 degrees in the z-axis so that it's pointing and so now it's perpendicular to the face and now we just need to translate it into the right position so it will need to go um, up half the thickness like this. Let's break that onto another line. There we go. And that puts it so that it's intersecting halfway through uh, the object here. And now we need to just move it along so that it's aligned to the um, uh, center, uh, center of this face here. So let's just uh, give it the offset so that it gets to the right place. There we go. Oops, it's wrong, wrong direction, like that. There we go. Now that's centered on that face. Now, of course, all we have to do here is calculate the difference. Put curly brackets around the whole thing and uh, do a bit of indentation just to keep it all tidy. There we are. Now, this is a phenomenon that I've noticed that's a bit weird. It seems to go uh, a little bit funny sometimes, as you can see uh, in preview mode. Now we can solve this by doing the full render mode, which goes ahead and does the full calculation of the objects for uh, exporting it. So I, uh, I don't know why the preview mode gets a bit confused sometimes, but uh, there you have it. When you uh, do the full render, you get uh, the correct outcome. And you can see we've got something that exactly matches the design we had in FreeCAD. Now, one useful thing about the language that I really like is that if we um, need to have a look at any part of this, uh, we can just put a hash in front of it and then it will highlight the object that we put a hash in front of. Uh, so for example, uh, it can be very useful when you've got a negative object that's being cut out of another. So now we can highlight that uh, pole that we cut through the middle even though it's invisible. And so that could be really useful when you're positioning something that's in the negative that doesn't uh, uh, appear in real space, or if you've got something that's made up of lots of pieces. So when you put the hash there, it helps you to see the object, even when it's invisible or hard to see for whatever reason. Okay, so now let's go back to the PCB frame, and I've got it loaded up in OpenSCAD. Now the file itself is uh, 173 lines long, and it's structured just the same as our example. I've set up a few variables at the top of the file. And then uh, we have the meat of this thing. It's divided into modules, uh, which is really useful for reusable code. And there really isn't much to this thing. It's very simple. Now, my review of the OpenSCAD experience is that it's obviously going to be less intuitive for not having a graphical user interface. You have to think in terms of geometry and uh, 
try and work out how things fit together in code, which is going to be less uh, easy to use than a graphical user interface. Also, at the moment, unlike some CAD tools, it doesn't have much support for organic curves and splines and that sort of thing. Although it does support revolves, uh, uh, things like that, but uh, some of its geometry uh, is slightly limited. But so far, it hasn't stopped me doing anything I want to do. Also, in my opinion, the 3D engine isn't as good as the one inside FreeCAD. So if you look here, you can see a certain limit to the resolution of this model here, and you can specify the resolution of curves, uh, what they're calculated to. Uh, but it's not thinking in terms of perfect mathematical surfaces uh, the way FreeCAD does. And the FreeCAD does this with Open Cascade, which is its uh, geometry kernel, whereas uh, this has its own uh, computational solid geometry uh, kernel inside which seems to think in terms of meshes so it would be really cool if uh, a, a version of open SCAD could be produced which used open cascade to do the maths in the middle because I think that would be nicer but it doesn't really matter you just set the resolution high enough so that you get a high enough re uh, resolution model out at the end now uh, the other thing in support of open SCAD is that uh, once you get familiar with it, it's pretty quick. I find that I am actually about as quick in FreeCAD as I am in OpenSCAD, sometimes a little bit faster in OpenSCAD, which I really wouldn't have thought at all. It's a bit counterintuitive, but there you go. I'm actually pretty quick using this thing. Uh, now, I have got a bit of programming background, of course, and I've done a bit of graphics programming before, but I think if you have uh, some uh, high school level familiarity with geometry and trigonometry and uh, things like that, uh, you should be able to get on with the language just fine. And also, if you're looking to improve your uh, maths for these things, it's a, probably a great way to practice getting better. And also, the uh, code that you see here, uh, one thing that it has over FreeCAD and always will is that uh, this code that you see here, it really lends itself to source control. So you can store this in Git. Uh, which really makes it convenient for doing experiments. And you can just put experiments on branches and try things out and go back to earlier stages of the design and that kind of thing. Uh, and also share your work with others. So, uh, and it's easier for other people to remix the design uh, when they need to. So I think that's uh, quite a pro that OpenSCAD has. And also because um, OpenSCAD is a bit more uh, finished. It's a little bit more stable when you use it. And also, like FreeCAD, it also has a very active community developing it as well. So believe it or not, I think I'm actually going to be doing most of my design work in OpenSCAD for the time being, which is certainly quite a surprise, but it seems to be suiting me really, really well. Well, that just about wraps it up for my review of the open source CAD tools. I hope you found it interesting. It certainly makes me very happy to see the amount of development effort going into this space. There's a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of exciting developments going on. So I really want to salute everyone who's involved with uh, making this happen. It's just wonderful to see. Now, as usual, if you check out the show notes, you'll find links to the code and various links to other things around the internet uh, that you might find interesting. So check that out. It's linked down below. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much for watching and I hope you found the video interesting and I'll see you next time on the Open Tech Lab.